system. Well, thank you, Tom, for the introduction and the welcome here. Thank you all for taking the time. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, it's been a delight for me in the last few weeks as somebody who has to think about the subject of covenant quite a lot. Uh, to think of it in a slightly new frame regarding the broader concerns of the creation project here and the wider array of events and uh, focuses that you're turning your attention to in these three years. And that's been very helpful, I think, for me in my own reflection. So my paper this afternoon is entitled Into the Family of God, a line from Calvin, Covenant and the Genesis of Life with God. And I begin with some comments on moral foundations, covenant, and what we'll call the missionary task of systematic theology. The wise one built his house on the rock, while the foolish one built his house on the sand. This binary analysis alerts us to the moral foundations of our experience. And not surprisingly, Christians through the centuries have thus thought about the wise and the foolish, the righteous and the wicked, the children of light, the children of darkness. More recently, the foundations seem to have multiplied. Moral psychologists Jonathan Haidt and Craig Joseph have suggested what they term moral foundations theory as a rubric through which one can assess cultural or ideological differences based on the six categories they identify. Harm, fairness, liberty, loyalty, authority, and at least four days out of the week, a sixth, purity. In so doing, they intentionally seek to glance more widely than of previously rationality-focused theories of moral judgment, looking first to intuitions, which then prompt rational and affective judgments of different sorts. They not only observe that ideological opponents or cultural aliens may differ on the fundamental definition of any one such foundation, but that they even differ with respect to which foundational intuitions are in play at all. In his more recent work, The Righteous Mind Height has discussed, for example, not merely variable perceptions of purity, but opposing valuations of the category's existence and value itself. If the words of our Savior should have alerted us to the significance of building on solid foundations, then these descriptive studies help alert us to the complexity and the variability of such labors. To the psalmist's question, what is man, we can find many answers. Yet foundations must be plotted, grounded in the right domain. Even biblical lineaments, to say nothing of divergent takes from the wider culture, must be thought together. As Oliver O'Donovan says, We'll read the Bible seriously only when we use it to guide our thoughts toward a comprehensive moral viewpoint, and not merely to articulate disconnected moral claims. We must look within it not only for moral bricks, but for indications of the order in which the bricks belong together. Whether it's the task of moral theology or the doctrine of God and His works more broadly, we quickly find that systematic reflection is prompted by the very nature of the Bible itself. Not only by the nature of the Bible, though, for we can say that systematic or dogmatic theology plays a unique role in the practice of moral reasoning, especially in a setting such as our own in the late modern Western world. In the kind of environment within which we move here, described by Charles Taylor under the category of expressive individualism, Systematic theology plays what I'll call a uniquely significant missionary task. When men and women come to faith with little to no sense of the broader principles and practices of the Christian way, then the task of looking far and wide, of thinking top to bottom, and of seeking to tie things together becomes all the more important. Systematic theology functions as a set of protocols, then, against narrowing our confession to something less than the whole counsel of God, or of centering or prioritizing our profession on matters of personal predilection or cultural prestige rather than biblical emphasis, or of mangling the shared and singular facets of biblical theological language vis-a-vis -vis the culture, or finally of lapsing into incoherence 
rather than appreciation of the biblical mystery, that in many times and in various ways the Word attested the one gospel of the incarnate Son. In each of these ways, systematic theology serves as an aid to more illumined reading of God's Word, that we might hear its notes harmoniously, and to more faithful attestation of the gospel, that we might be a true chorus of confession. These analytic moments, then, are a missionary mode of systematic theology. It's significant to speak, as does Nicholas Lash, of theology as what he calls a set of protocols against idolatry in this way, to note the role of theology as a form of intellectual discipleship and to observe the constant interplay between dogmatics and ascetics. Given the formative ways in which we're shaped here by life in Babylon, by which I, I don't mean to suggest the blissful setting of Trinity International University, nor the lapsarian-tinged climate of the Midwest, but rather the powers and principalities at work in our wider culture, we do well to tend to ourselves, and to that end, to tend to our language, realizing that we need Jeremiah's word to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The living and active word of God cuts not only through kingdoms with power, but piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of our very hearts. Systematic theology plays a role in aiding that intellectual discipleship by giving a sense of the scope and the sequence of God's Word. So we come to the creation project, to Genesis, and, my wager on the table, the value in disciplining ourselves to avoid narrowing, misprioritizing, mangling, or going incoherent in tempting false starts or, to put it all in happier terms, to the value in reading this portion of Holy Scripture with the grain of the wider biblical text and canon. The book of Genesis sketches the moral foundations not only of human society and of creatureliness, but specifically of the church and her worship. To help make sense of both origins and ends, the book draws our attention to the doctrine of the covenant and the pledge that people are drawn into the family of God. Covenant comes from Genesis, whether in the overt form of divine dealings with Noah and Abram, or in the implicit foundations of life in the garden, and the deep magic underneath God's providential care to Joseph's kin. Not surprisingly, covenant plays a pivotal role in the sketching of redemptive history, functioning like a hub within which so many pivots of prophetic instruction are rooted will follow in the next few minutes the basic theological moves of the doctrine of the covenant in this particularly fundamental text, seeking to sketch its implications for a number of theological and especially anthropological concerns. My concern is not so much to argue for the centrality of covenant here by drawing on word studies or exegetical reasoning on particular snippets of Genesis, as it is rather to help show how this theological category alerts the reader to the broader patterns of the text. In so doing, I'm going to seek to provide something of what we could call an index by which to draw out the intellectual role played by the category of covenant. As we begin, I think we do well to note that instruction on covenant, like that of the doctrine of creation more broadly, carries with it moral and ascetical impulses. The late John Webster spoke of that primal work of God, saying, most of all, it obliges those who consider it to recover the posture of creatures, the dependence and gratitude of derivation, and the repudiation of self-subsistence. And this is acutely hard for the children of Adam, for we contend against our creaturely nature and calling, from stupidity or pride or fear that unless we snatch at our being and make ourselves authors of its perpetuation and dignity, it will slip away from us. And so we propose to ourselves, sometimes a little guiltily, sometimes with frank confidence, that we constitute a given reality against which all else is arranged. Even God may be so placed as God for us, a protagonist whose identity, not wholly unlike our own, 
is bound to us and whose presence confirms the limitless importance of the human drama. As with Webster's comments regarding the intellectual asceticism of thinking creation, so I think we can find it to be so with covenant. It calls us out of ourselves and it disciplines our thoughts, like our breath, to find sustenance from the outside, to change our posture so as to bow before our Creator, to kneel before our Judge, and to lift our hands up unto our Redeemer. To that end, we want to turn to ask now how the doctrine of the covenant casts new light on the creature and the wider creation. And I'm going to very quickly touch on that may not feel terribly quickly in the late afternoon, but I'm going to touch on the four ways in which systematic theology helps frame our thinking about covenant and relation to God. Treating rather briefly the breadth of Scripture here, turning to linger over the three remaining tasks, the ways in which covenant illumines the emphases of God's Word, the way in which it draws out the common and proper forms of communicating the good news, and last, the way it ties together key strands of biblical instruction in a coherent, even if not comprehensive, fashion. So, the centrality of fellowship on biblical breadth and evangelical emphases. Many things may rightly, even necessarily, be confessed of human creatures. Embodiment, rationality, sexuality, so forth. Christian anthropology takes up the task of moral psychology even while tending to our animal nature. Cornell West regularly reminds us we live between womb and tomb, and therefore our depiction of the human has to remain funky. Fair enough, and I think he's right. And Genesis helps suggest ways in which thinking about God, humanity, and the wider creation dare not get unhelpfully abstract lest we forget the fruit and the foreskin the ways in which sin and redemption occur amidst our entangled existence. Rusty Reno's meditations on Genesis remind us that here, perhaps, is nowhere else. We catch what he calls the scandal of particularity, which we dare not miss, a scandal that bears impact upon every nook and cranny of our existence. Systematic theology has a calling to keep us from theological myopia, enlarging our vision to take in the full breadth of God's teaching regarding creation and its many facets. True enough, but attentiveness proves to be crucial also, especially in remaining alert to the priorities of the Christian confession. Just as the priority of the image of God speaks to the character of the human in a particularly Godward way, so the doctrine of the covenant also attests a distinctly theological anthropology and doctrine of creation more broadly. And here we come to that second calling of systematic theology, not only tending to the breadth of the Bible, but attending to the ascending order of concerns therein. Emphases matter, and we dare not assume that our gravest concerns match the scriptural order of love. We begin with an eye to the wider canon. The centrality of fellowship with God can be seen in noting the two dominant strands through which the prophets and the apostles highlight this life with God and the salvation He offers. They employ no metaphors or images so much as those of marriage and of adoption. Perhaps no canonical feature is so startling in this first regard than the inclusion of the Song of Songs in Holy Scripture. Jews and Christians alike have noted the theological significance of the text is directly related to its symbolic meaning, namely that it portrays the intimate communion of Yahweh and His people in the starkest of terms, that is, those drawn from the realm of conjugal bliss. The prevalence of Song of Songs in patristic and medieval homiletics and liturgy manifests its remarkable impact on the Christian imagination conveying this rich and personal union with God that's to mark our very lives. Indeed, Carl Schuv in a recent book has shown how far from being an interpretative problem, the Song of Songs in early Christian Latin theology was used most frequently as the settled text by which you arbitrate other confusing exegetical judgments. Modern reading habits have rendered us less capable of sensing the power of that classical focus on the song. That's to our loss, I would suggest. 
Our forebears knew how to read what might seem abstract love songs in light of the particular promise of God's love for Israel. And the metaphor of adoption and familial love is equally emphasized across the canon. Inasmuch as the love of the father for the son takes the form of sharing that beneficence with his many adopted brothers and sisters who are fellow heirs with Christ. Israel had been identified as God's son, the lineage of the beloved son Isaac. And that language later applies to her Davidic king. Eventually in Jesus Christ, all believers share in this inheritance of Abraham's seed. What's notable throughout the redemptive historical development is that the image employed to depict the divine human relation is one of familial identity, the parent-child bond. The repeated use of these metaphors and the manner in which adjoining language is so regularly employed in the imaginative and literary structures of the canon signals this biblical emphasis on the relational intimacy and the personal fellowship between God and His people that's conveyed in its own way by each of these two images. This prevalence flows from imagery found much earlier in Genesis. The theophanies of Genesis occur with little fanfare. Genesis 12, 7 strikes us with its plainness. Then Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, To your seed I will give this land. William Browns contrasted the appearance of God in Genesis with the cataclysmic and the pyrotechnic manner of divine nearness in either the burning bush or the terror of Sinai, particularly as described in Hebrews 12, 18-21. Genesis speaks in ordinary tones. It inspires songs like, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. In so doing, the text commends the telos of human existence to be with God as being as plain and normal as could be. We can see this emphasis upon fellowship in the rendering of Genesis 17 as well, namely the promise of progeny in verse 4 and of land in verse 8 climaxes with the encore, I will be their God. But this deep bond doesn't begin with that patriarch. It goes all the way back into the primeval account. The text of Genesis 1 and 2 also manifests this concern. Immediately upon creation, The human being is identified as related to God, his image and likeness, as commissioned by God, subduing the earth and having dominion, being fruitful and multiplying, and as being present with God. He walks with me in the garden. And this last point's worth drawing out. When God concludes his work of creation, it culminates in his dwelling there or resting on the seventh day. Indeed, we learn later it's not unusual for the Lord God to walk in the garden with the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Chapter 3, verse 8. We not only see the intended intimacy between the Creator God and the human creature in this Edenic reality, but we observe them contrasted with the curse extended in Genesis 3. Notice the immediate result of human sin is death. As Genesis 2, 17 puts it in the absolute infinitive, the most definitive, form we could have, in the day you eat of that tree, dying you shall die. What do we find in Genesis 3? Death is manifest in the form of dismissal from Eden, from the tree of life, ultimately from communion with the one true God. They don't drop dead, but they do leave God's presence. And so we see the climax of the curse matches the climax of nature in the creation account. They're about the very presence of God and fellowship with the Almighty. Whether in the Sabbath gift of the seventh day or that final curse of Genesis 3, we see that human beings are made above all else for life with God. And by implication, we might say that God is intent upon sharing that triune life with us. For this reason, as John Levinson and Gordon Wenham have shown, the creation accounts make use of temple imagery to depict their purpose in helping us understand human life meant for the very presence of or space of God. And of course, the Holy Scriptures will conclude here as well. The final portrait of our blessed hope depicts a new Jerusalem. The glorified city is arrayed with all manner of blessing and of bling. It's a return to Edenic life. The tree of life is present there. It's not merely a trip back to an innocent garden. It's a journey forward to a glorified heavens and earth. The perfection of God has spread over the whole span of created reality. 
The king's promise is nothing less than, 21 verse 5, Behold, I'm making all things new. The central promise, however, is not of newness, but of nearness. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. The absence of a particular place called the temple is shown to be beside the point inasmuch as the reality to which that shadow pointed is found in its fullness. God is present and available everywhere in this new and glorified Holy of Holies. And divine presence is not only the Alpha and the Omega of biblical teaching. This fellowship between the triune God and his people serves as the focal point of the canon's central episode. Jesus is Emmanuel before anything else. God with us. His gospel involves the claim that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That language of tabernacling points to this reality, the personal presence of the one true God in the face of Jesus Christ. The centrality finds expression most powerfully, of course, in the transfiguration account. As Peter observes the powerful divine presence with all the verbal cues pointing to something along the lines of those displays Moses beheld atop Mount Sinai in Exodus 34. And he notes that they need to cover Jesus and his two new friends, Moses and Elijah, up. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. The disciple clearly interprets the events along the lines of divine glory coming near. The answer from the heavens doesn't reverse or downgrade that interpretation. By the time the heavens have replied... The disciples have fallen still further on their faces and are truly terrified. Yet Jesus comes to touch them and to say, rise and have no fear. Surely this event points to the way in which the gospel economy makes possible that transition from Genesis 3 and Exodus 34, where sinners can't enjoy the presence of God, to Revelation 21 and 22, where we're promised a world full of the glorious divine dwelling. With that turn, those who can't see can even be touched, and those in peril are told to have no fear, for their God is near. Second, the form of the covenant on biblical borrowing and doctrinal distinctiveness. Another task of systematic reflection in its missionary mindset relates to borrowing and modifying, to the common and the proper. Scriptural language comes from and returns into a wider world of communication. So we work with words that can wield shared meaning or may take notable redefinition. We fix our attention on images which are common, but also commandeered to a unique cause. And we linger with questions that are anthropologically basic, but are addressed to and of the singular God of Israel and of Jesus. We do well then to assess the ways in which the biblical instruction of prophets and apostles, in this case of Genesis itself, is and is not distinctive over and against other forms of communication and confession. As we speak of covenant, we are in the thick of it. If ever it were clear that we trade in koine and not in some specially devised lingo of the Holy Ghost, Greek or otherwise, it's here. Covenant is the language of the prince and of the polis, of the marriage and of the market. Decades ago, archaeologists shed light on comparative resources, and William Moran, Moshe Weinfeld, and Dennis McCarthy showed light cast on Pentateuchal texts by reading them over and against ancient Near Eastern references to covenants of varying sorts. More recent years have only brought further analysis and light, as Gary Knoppers and John Levinson have continued to explore parallels. Observing parallels, of course, does not equate to interpreting meaning. Covenant comes as common lingo, but it's put toward the most particular ends here in Genesis. God's pledge to Abram, 12.3, will have global significance, though it takes the form of attention to progeny and much later to a particular dynasty. Genealogy tells many things, I suppose, most of which I'm probably too much of an amateur to note, But central among them has to be the significance of election for covenant. In his concert lectures delivered here 10 years ago now, John Webster addressed that tie-in, saying, quote, like creation, election is a divine fiat, ex nihilo, 
Covenant means election, and election is uncaused origination. I think it must be noted that provenience in and of itself is not a distinctive mark of biblical covenants. Agreements are proffered and suggested all the time, initiated by one party or another. The unique character of this covenant concerns its ex nihilo fashion, namely, God elects Israel when, strictly speaking, Israel does not exist. Abram has much, wife and wealth, kin and a company, but he has no son, no heir, yet God summons him that his progeny might cover the earth with blessing, be as numerous as the stars of the heavens, and to bless the very nations who, unlike his line, already exist numerously. Divine election defines the unique nature of this covenant. As Paul will later put it, God is not served by human hands as though He needed anything. This divine sufficiency or fullness was expressed long before in the identifying or naming of God to His servant Moses. Before He was named in Exodus 3.15 as the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, He was already named as I am who I am. Whereas ancient grants and loyalty oaths of varying sorts invariably concerned benefit and blessing, necessity and diplomacy, we see that God's action cuts against the grain of covenant cutting. As with creation, so with covenant. Election is apart from merit or fitness. It's without concern for provision or progress on the part of God. The Bible intentionally conveys the shape of divine fellowship through the admittedly common lens of covenant, but the Scriptures shape that confession in a way that comports with the singular and unique being of God. This God can choose the void and the infertile, the weak and the lowly. When the promise to Abram seems to finally be within sight, Moses must attest to the counterintuitive nature of God's election of Israel, saying, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh. Eventually, those words from Deuteronomy 7 will be resounded by the attestation of Peter, speaking of the elect people of God, who are named as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, and who will attest that once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. This he attributes to the action of God from nothing, alluding to Genesis 1 and his claim that this God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Prophet and apostle alike see the basis of covenant ultimately not in the aptitude or quantity of the people, but in the electing love of the Lord solely in his divine mercy. Biblical covenants ought not be shoehorned into some extra-biblical form. Gary Knoppers has suggested what others are busy working out in greater detail, namely that we've got good reason to question older archaeological and comparative analyses of ancient Near Eastern covenants falling into either the conditional or unconditional type. John Levinson and others have shown more recently, and more fundamental to my purposes, that these categories just prove less illumining in reading the accounts of Genesis. The Abrahamic covenant, for instance, can't be likened unconditional inasmuch as Abraham's faith commends him. We do have good reason to catch the way in which Paul construes the Abraham cycle differently from other Jewish interpreters who would read Abraham much like Phineas, as a man of zeal and obedience whose final willingness to sacrifice Isaac prompts God to say, now I see that you fear God. Perhaps this is what James has in mind, arguing in James 2.24. But Paul not only locates justification prior to the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22, but in Romans 4 he also marks it as prior to the relatively minuscule sacrifice of his foreskin in Genesis 17. Such is the argument of Romans 4, 9-11. Faith, not works, says the apostle. 
Faith is a unique sort of condition. It's not new with Abraham, more on that later, but it must not be missed that faith, faith does serve as a condition. Abraham pleases God, Hebrews 11.6, and is declared righteous, according to Romans 4.3, with his trust, as they read Genesis 15.6. The apostolic analysis refines and doesn't reject the causality of the covenant. Scholastic theologians and Protestant confessions will later speak rather poignantly of the instrumental causality of faith in the covenant. A standard definition is found in Westminster Larger Catechism 73. How does faith justify a sinner in the sight of God? Faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God not because of those other graces which do always accompany it, or of good works that are the fruits of it, nor as if the grace of faith or any act thereof were imputed to him for justification, but only as it's an instrument by which he receives and applies Christ and his righteousness. That scholastic concern to distinguish the causal character of faith, which is refined and nuanced, it only makes sense if faith is first and foremost construed as a condition and a cause, raising the relevant question of what sort and in what way. To consider this conditional character of even the Abrahamic covenant serves as but one entryway by which the familiar distinction between grants and oaths ought to be refined radically or even replaced. Whether such a, sch a schema helpfully sorts the varying covenantal options in the ancient Near Eastern world, it does not seem to elucidate the specific character of the covenants in Genesis. Nothing so demonstrates this particular distinctiveness as the vision given to Abraham in Genesis 15:17 where the Lord himself passes through the heifer, goat, and ram remains. The familiar logic of lordship would suggest the servant ought to perform a vow here and offer a pledge symbolically as to the gravity of their responsibility. Abraham's worry voiced in his query in verse 8 was matched by God's resolve. We see hints of what form this trek through treachery might take even in a divine provision of the sacrifice in Genesis 22:13, In summing up this line of thought, we can say the divine covenants relate to a global itch, namely to be bound to others for the sake of one's good. Yet the global phenomenon takes a particular form, which does, not, which does prove to be rather scandalous. John Barclay has used the language of incongruity to describe grace in Paul over against many of his Jewish contemporaries. We can, I think, appropriately speak of the divine covenants as revealing God's primordial delight in showing incongruous grace to his people. Indeed, Westminster Confession, chapter 7, section 1, says this before it says anything else about the covenant. Namely, quote, the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition in him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. We see there covenant in Genesis helps show the global yearning for divine human relations, as well as the particular distinctive form of their consummation in and through the God who provides. Finally, the fittingness of faith for humans on theological coherence. Finally, we do well to explore the ways in which covenant helps show significant coherence amongst various prongs of biblical instruction. In Genesis itself, covenant helps tie together different strands of scriptural interpretation. Later texts, ranging from the debated Hosea 6-7 to the oft-forgotten Isaiah 24-5, speak of the covenant or the everlasting covenant in ways which seem to trace it back beyond even its explicit attestation in Genesis. Such texts have suggested to interpreters that covenant proves basic to Christian anthropology, that we're authorized by good and necessary consequence to speak of a covenant in creation, oftentimes called a covenant of works or a covenant of nature. Within the Reformed tradition, 
the most common approach to describing this relational order and vocational telos of human existence before God has been to describe not only covenant with God, but specifically a covenant of works instituted by God. The Westminster Confession of Faith articulates this rather famously, saying, the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. We can see a number of items there. The covenant of works involves a goal, life for Adam and posterity. It involves a condition or requirement, perfect and personal obedience to all God's commands. While the covenant of works was initiated unilaterally by the Lord, maintenance of life in God's favor and enjoyment of His final bestowal of life forevermore requires human responsive action. Thus, the provision of grace, not just life itself, but also divine presence and proclamation, it leads to and it calls forth human action. Well, we've considered ways in which the doctrine of the covenant alerts us to a fundamentally theological construal of creation and of human creaturehood. I want to conclude by reflecting on how this helps us think about the shape of human holiness, the way in which the doctrine of the covenant of works reveals much about the course of creaturely holiness, noting two angles quickly and then turning to reflect on two more at greater length. First, this primal covenant, as with all others, tells us of God, not merely of creatures. God chooses to be with us, not apart from us. God enters freely, apart from need or lack within, apart from prompting or pressure without. Nonetheless, God does enter into this pact with our ancestors, and this, like every word of the gospel to come, tells us something profound, first and foremost, not of ourselves, but of God. Not that God can be reduced or framed fully by the works of the divine economy or the glorious news of merciful action for our good, but that God is revealed herein. Father, Son, and Spirit are shown to take their fellowship toward others in an inclusive manner, that their glory in life might be shared and communicated. In so doing, this triune love comes to be common, the most basic rendering of the word communicated, in an ordered mode which is appropriately signaled by the language of covenant, that is, of ordered relationship. We don't have access to the Godhead willy-nilly, but we do so through the Son in the Spirit. Covenant cutting from the very beginning tells us much then, not only about the common characteristic of God's fullness that proceeds outward, but even about its proper form through the ministrations of Son and of Spirit. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. For the psalmist goes on to say, full of splendor and majesty is His work. I'd love to linger here regarding that theological significance of the fact that covenant proves to be basic to God's ways in His external works, and thus revelatory of His being and character. But my immediate charge is to reflect more fully on the anthropological and creational implications. So we press on. Second item, the covenant of works witnesses to God's universal designs for communion with His human creatures. In the ancient world, the phraseology of the image of God could be restricted regularly to positions of prestige, most famously the emperor or the king. But Genesis 1 identifies the male and the female, indeed the entirety of the human species, as made after God's likeness and in His image. Still further, we learn that Adam represents us all in this covenant, such that his actions have implications for all men and women. The Apostle Paul insisted to the Romans that all were in Adam and suffering the effect of his failed work in this covenant. We may say then that the covenant of works bound all humans at its time of inception to approach fellowship with God in this particular way. And we should confess still further that the covenant of works continues to bind all men and women to relate to God in this specific manner. I trust other papers in the creation project will linger at just this point. So I'm going to move on to address points three and four. Third, the covenant of works shows that communion with God is bounded by the commands of God. That is, 
A moral order governs relational proximity. My eyes are upon the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me, we read. Not only must we see the moral shape to the fellowship, but we observe that the Creator God is the covenantal Lord, and thus the one who determines the order of that fellowship. God initiates life together, and thus God sketches its contours. God gives commandments, and He sets expectation, and there is apparently no room for negotiation. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who doesn't lift up his soul to what is false and doesn't swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. These formed obligations are not arbitrary either, for the psalmist also tells us the Lord is righteous, he loves righteous deeds, the upright will behold his face. We turn from fellowship generally then to covenant specifically. At its most basic level, a covenant is a relationship that's been ordered so as to have a particular form. Humans cross paths, and they encounter others in happenstance encounters every day. Such nebulous connections can and should be contrasted, however, with the kind of committed and defined relations marked by a political, economic, or theological covenant. We learn in Genesis that God grants that order and reveals that shape. Of the various theophanies that occur in the text, it's the covenant dream of Genesis 15, verses 7 to 21, including the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch, and appearing more similar thus to the later appearances of Exodus. Only when covenant appears as the defined and deepened theophonic presence does all the cataclysmic and pyrotechnic imagery set in yet again. We oftentimes chafe at order being bestowed on us from the outside without our election. Milton's Paradise Lost portrays Lucifer with the message, I know none before me, I'm self-begot. Oliver O'Donovan diagnosed this condition three decades ago, saying when every activity is understood as making, then every situation into which we act is seen as raw material, waiting to have something made of it. If there's no category in thought for an action which is not artifactual, then there's no restraint in action which can preserve phenomena which are not artificial. This imperils not only or even primarily the environment, it imperils what it is to be human, for it deprives human existence itself of certain spontaneities of being and doing, spontaneities which depend on the reality of a world which we have neither made nor imagined but which simply confronts us to evoke our love, fear, and worship. Creation attests a life that comes to us apart from our own choosing, by what the prophets and apostles call the will of God. And we do well to note that the metaphysical agency of the Creator finds its match in the moral legislation of the Maker. Fundamental to owning one's nature as creature, then, comes in holding a posture that's dependent and receptive. We do well to note that basic human commitment signaled by John Levinson in this regard, discovering ourselves to be in relationships that we never choose, is a key component of the process of being responsible adults, he says. If we can identify those commitments from weak fathers and mothers and siblings and the like, how much more? the covenantal order of the family of God. Fellowship with God does take particular shape and form. It's perhaps, perhaps helpful to think about the link between the beginning, protology, and the end, eschatology. The very same God who made the heavens and the earth and all things therein destines them to a particular glory and perfection. Again, John Webster's helpful. He says, this means that to be a creature is to be appointed by God the Creator to a specific destiny or end. As the creature receives its being at the loving hands of God and is formed to be a particular being, so also the creature is pointed to a particular perfection, namely full fellowship with God. Creatures are not merely caused, they're summoned to fulfill their nature over time, to realize themselves according to the form bestowed upon them. The central focus of the human vocation will be full fellowship with God, and this relational reality takes specific and particular form befitting human nature and the form bestowed on them 
And using those words, Webster's highlighting the common calling of all humans by their Creator and Lord. In the wider Catholic tradition, others have articulated the order by pointing to the doctrine of the image of God. Similarly, others, Webster included, have discussed the doctrine of human nature, arguing that biblical teaching disallows us from shirking the idea of a human substance or a nature that binds us all together in a common beginning and a desired end. Two, the categories of image and of nature or substance, we in the Reformed tradition add the category of the covenant of works. One fourth and final point about that. Fourth, the covenant of works involves the basic demand that humans entrust themselves to their creator God. As the creature has itself in being with respect to God, so also it ought to have itself in working. The mode of working follows the mode of being. Notice that central to the command here is the calling to eat, to receive sustenance in the right way. Christians are committed to the doctrine of creation from nothing, precisely to signal the free work of a God who gives and doesn't take life. All the way down goes God's grace. As Oswald Beyer says, creation and new creation are both categorical gift. The first word to the human being is a gifting word. You may freely eat of every tree. Renewed in the gifting word of the Lord's Supper, take and eat. This is my body given for you. The inverse, of course, is that human being is gift all the way down and straight through history. We began with the fruit of the garden. We end with the feast of the city to come. Always we are fed by another's generous provision. But the question arises, where and how will one eat? How will life be procured? By God's design and directive or by one's own or another's intuition and wisdom? Fundamental to that moral quandary is the matter of one's trust, whether placed in oneself or in another. The deepest calling of the covenant of works is the summons to consistent and perfect, unceasing and constant trust in the God who created, who promised, and who gives again and again. That it's termed by many, classically, to be a covenant of works, in no way means that it doesn't involve, at its very heart, the call to trust as the first work. The covenant does include other commands, what to eat, what not to eat, how to exercise dominion, the Sabbath command, and, as many have argued in Jewish and Reformed traditions, the entirety of the Decalogue. Yet we do well to note that the heart of its call is a matter of trust. And here we can return to our earlier comments on faith in the later Abrahamic covenant. A condition to be sure, but a condition of a certain sort. We read Genesis at this point with the guidance of the apostle, for we can see the way that Paul interprets Abraham's story and draws out teaching on justification before God. Pausing to consider the prepositions helps us see something of the unique posture of faith. In Paul, the instrumentality of faith is expressed in various forms. We are justified through faith, diapistios, by faith, ekpistios, by faith, the date of piste. Interestingly, never are we said to be justified on account of faith, kata piston, or on the basis of faith, dia piston, with one potential exception in Philippians 3, which is immediately epexegetically qualified by the following phrase, epite piste, the date of instrumental. Faith uniquely amongst the many actions performed by human creatures points away from the power of the one who believes. And it fully stands or falls upon the trustworthiness of its object. This is why the word trusting is often used not as a compliment, but rather as a pejorative to describe someone who is gullible and taken in, who leans upon the promises and uh, the, the calling of another who doesn't warrant it. Not surprisingly then, Faith marks the beginning and end of creaturely action, for it so fittingly expresses the metaphysical and covenantal character of our very being. To the typical assumptions about the contents of the book of Genesis, John Calvin appended another and final end that we see, quote, 
The Holy Fathers, one after another, having by faith embraced the offered promise, were collected together into the family of God in order that they might have a common life in Christ. Indeed, several ends are actually found therein. He says that we may know what's the society of the true church and the communion of faith amongst the children of God. He says that they might seek the certainty of this adoption from the covenant which the Lord had ratified with their fathers. And that they might know that there was no other God, no other right faith. Assurance of different sorts is also found therein. For he said, but it was also his, God's will, to testify to all ages that whosoever desired to worship God aright, to be deemed members of his church, must pursue no other course than that which is here prescribed. Our admittedly piecemeal sketch of the doctrine of the covenant, and in particular the covenant of works, reveals a good bit about the shape of human holiness, the project of instilling moral foundations so that righteous intuitions prompt our calling to wise discernment. Humans were created above all else for fellowship with the triune God. The Lord's original design centered on this communion and took the form of moral and relational guidance fit to bring them into the social spiritual reality. Many details might and should be traced further and are by others throughout the tradition and I hope throughout your project. Yet we've reflected widely enough to see the ways in which the initial covenant relationship relates to the definition of and the path to human holiness. Indeed, the very notion of taking on the character of one's heavenly Father, as in the covenant relations of the divine family. In so doing, the covenant draws a number of notes together into a harmony and a chorus. It helps alert us to the melody line of Genesis so that we might hear God's insistent call to fellowship with Him with the abruptness and resolve it deserves that we might otherwise miss amidst the tragedy and the deliverance, the primal mystery, and the cosmic scope. While the text itself gestures toward the significance of our term, the concept of covenant helps alert us as we go back to the text to do so with a distinctly Christian span of attention and breadth, sequence of priorities and emphases, a tint and alert shape of commonality and distinctiveness, and ultimately a sense of the unity of the mystery of faith, spoken in many times in various ways. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm wondering if we have any questions uh, this afternoon. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And uh, I'll offer, and if not, yeah, did you, Jeff? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, please come to the mics. We have one on uh, either side here. And so uh, uh, just ask your question, please. I'm, uh, I'm a Presbyterian, and so uh, obviously very, very sympathetic to everything oh. that you said. So thank you, first of all. Um, and, and I wonder if I can, um, uh, let's see, see how you think about a subject that, in my mm -hmm. view, is um, underrepresented in mm -hmm. our tradition when it comes to covenant. Sure. Uh, as you were finishing, you mentioned that human beings were created for communion with the triune God. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, how could anyone disagree with that? However, um, one, one aspect that, that is basically missing in mm -hmm. our tradition of reflecting on the covenant is the, is the covenant as a means by which a people are established. Mm -hmm. That is to say, not simply the vertical, but also the right. horizontal. Yeah. Um, you, you, with, without naming names, you mention aspects of the tradition that uh, think of the covenant of works in very demanding terms. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that, that side of the tradition right. has no room for what Israel is as a society. They only think mm -hmm. of the curses in terms of personal salvation, right. which, which is a, a disaster when it comes to exegesis of right. Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, and it doesn't explain what Israel is. So I, I wonder if, right. if you would um, sort of uh, add to your reflections by thinking on the sort of the horizontal level and the way in which covenantal inclusion, solidarity, right. um, gosh, it even has controversial right. uh, aspects like inclusion of our children and so forth, just, just to, you know, throw sure. a cat amongst the pigeons. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'd, like to, uh, I'd, I'd like to see a little bit more of that. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's one worthy of a lot of thought, not just exegetically, but historically, because uh, you may have caught, I, I, I brought in a number of lines from Calvin toward the end, especially, virtually all of which are communal, social, and, and humanly social in nature. And Calvin was not simply the, the, the one figure of his era who had an eye to that either. That was standard fare. And even in a, a confession like Westminster, alongside earlier confessions from the 16th century, uh, that, would, that would be fundamental to Reformed covenantal exegesis, which begins, by the way, with arguing for infant baptism in the 1520s. I mean, that's where the whole industry starts as a genre. So the issue of society and of, of communal life is, is not just an add-on or an accident or a happenstance, but a generative prompting. Uh, I share your concern, without giving names and addresses, about the fact that that often gets sort of shaved off the edge or ripped out of the center. Um, and, and I think we'd have to look a lot later uh, to the way in which it gets presented in the time of the first and then the second awakenings. Uh, to some extent, I don't think we can wait just till revivalism and, and the kind of preaching of the 19th century that hits the Reformed tradition. But even earlier, uh, you've, you've, you've got some problems already in the 18th century in the way it gets described. Um, but, but by the time you, you kick through revivalism and reformed soteriology gets severed from ecclesiology and a theology of culture, you've got a, you've got a rather different beast, um, and it's a hybrid. Uh, and, you know, Nate Hatch's book on democratization is really helpful in describing the 19th century element, but I think we'd managed to muck it up in certain ways before then. Um, but the, 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 the prominence of both, I don't like the language of the cultural mandate. Uh, I don't know a, a better shorthand that's commonly known, but the, the predominance of Genesis 128 to 30 in the tradition on the one hand, and then of the role of Genesis 15 to 17, and especially uh, the idea of generational uh, identification. Uh, that runs all the way through Numbers and Deuteronomy especially, um, that, that, that just shows a richer approach to what's going on that is very significant. And that so many later debates don't make sense unless you presume that. The way the prophets can berate people doesn't make sense unless there's a rich social identity. Uh, and the way Paul and the apostles chew over questions, uh, what do you do with Gentiles and so forth, doesn't make sense unless there's, there's that notion of solidarity. Um, there's a danger of overreacting, and I think some Pauline exegetes have got this notion that you can have like the social notion of election apart from individual election, and, and that just strikes me as remarkably strange. Uh, there's a really good book by Ben Dunson on Romans 9 to 11 in that regard on community and individuality, um, but we shouldn't err on the other side either. Um, so I, I think I'd be very sympathetic to to trying to recover that, that wider, integrated approach. Do you have particular thoughts about that? I mean, Lots. okay. <laughs> I, I'd love to hear more, yeah. Yes, Hans. Hey, thanks for the lecture. Yeah. Uh, since Jack was started up, I, I'm fellow PCA as well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted just to hear a comment on, as you know, within our circles, um, the covenant of works has been debated, uh, particularly, at least for two reasons. One, mm -hmm. exegetically, right. um, a concern that um, the, the exegetical evidence is, is wanting. But then secondly, secondly, theologically, that you have law preceding grace, or law being more fundamental to grace. And right. so worries that... Right. Uh, a tradition that emphasizes the covenant of works ends up having sort of these deep pastoral problems right. because of that uh, framework. Right. So, um, and so my question is, I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew McGowan. Mm -hmm. He has an essay from 2005 where he, he's drawing on John Murray's mm -hmm. criticisms mm -hmm. of the tradition 
and a proposal to just talk of an ad Adamic administration as opposed to a covenant of works. Right. And so uh, McGowan wants to say, well, let's, what's most important is the Adam Christ uh, sort of symmetry, the, the sure. representative roles. So let's talk about headship theology and right. drop the whole works. Right. I'm wondering what you think about McGowan. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of strands in there. And, and Murray's argument, I think, over and against a bunch of folks in the Presbyterian world is actually not that radical. I don't agree with all of his takes, but uh, some people think he's out there with Karl Barth in, in denying for the, you know, the notion that law in any sense can precede gospel. Um, so I think it's worth noting the way he structures it is, is in lots of ways fundamentally parallel to what's going on. It's, it's nomenclature. Um, I would have a concern. I don't think that in speaking of there being a covenant and of calling a covenant where I, were we able to rewrite 500 years of history uh, and, and words didn't have histories, a covenant of nature would, it seems to me, be a lot more commendable. Uh, but we live in traditions and words, words have meaning. Um, and it seems to me that, that what's fundamental is over and against some people, say Meredith Klein in the Presbyterian world, uh, we need to just realize that grace is not always redemptive. Um, and we know that because we know of common grace that's not redemptive. Uh, and we know that because we're here and it was gift that we're here and it was a gift that we were given food, and I think we were given access to the tree of life before the fall, and, and there were all manner of gifts. The law was a gift. Uh, when you start a new job and you don't know what you're to do, when someone tells you what you should do, that's a gift. Uh, it, it, it requires further gifts, but it's a helpful thing to have clarity about the way in which you ought to run. Um, and, and so I think we ought to talk about a whole slew of graces that were present there. But I do think if we lose the notion of justice, holiness, righteousness, and law in that natural setting, that's the fundamental reason for using the language of covenant, if we lose that, then some of the elements of what everyone agrees are in the covenant of grace just don't make a lot of sense. Why sacrifice? Why is this intuitive? Why is this woven into to the Mosaic covenant? And that leads to further disagreements with some who would treat the Mosaic Covenant as not including grace. Uh, you know, baked into its, its recipe is the idea of this ongoing sacrificial uh, posture of, of, of faithfully seeking forgiveness. Um, but there is that demand for perfection, Genesis 2.17, in the day you eat of it, dying you will die. Um, and, and the definition of death is perhaps surprising. He doesn't croak, uh, but the most profound nature of death does occur. He's out of God's presence. Uh, and, and I think the idea of the covenant alerts us to the significance of that. And that's what good doctrine does. Uh, whether it's a, a verb, or a sort of verbiage found directly in a chapter or not, it's, it's a term or a concept that alerts you to something in the text. Uh, just like Trinity and Trinitarian language alerts us to features in Old and New Testament passages, I think Covenant of Works language helpfully alerts us uh, to a number of elements moving on there. Uh, there could be other words that perform a similar function, uh, but not starting de novo, living within a church with a tradition, I, I think we're wise to take and, and work with that helpfully. Anyhow. Thank you. You prefer the term nature as opposed to creation uh, as far as the, uh, the covenant? covenant of I do, yeah. I mean, I, I just think the notion of nature over and against grace is a much helpful, more classical distinction that gets at a lot of the same ideas. Um, however you define it, though, you're having to, again, deal with not only common verbiage but distinctive uses. Uh, I mean, on the other side, the notion that the second covenant, after Genesis 3, or later, depending on where you, you see it initiating, that it's called grace. I think we need to be careful. That doesn't mean grace didn't exist before, but there's a, a new dimension to grace. You could 
refer to it as merciful redemptive grace. Um, so we need to we need to be alert to how words are being used. And even there, you know, theologically, because because a term doesn't use that is covenant, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that there wasn't necessarily right. a covenant there yep. in creation and nature. Another question? Common yes. law marriage, you yeah. know, just happens. Yes, uh, please. I particularly enjoyed the, the comment on the ex nihilo aspect of covenant. Yeah. And I appreciated also your brief treatment on the command to fill the earth and subdue it in Genesis. Okay. And my question kind of combines the two of those together. Hmm. Um, post fall, the, the command, the assignment to mm -hmm. fill the earth and subdue it changed um, its mm -hmm. nature a little bit. And um, I was curious um, as Christians today in the fray of the covenant, as you said, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the mix of it, um, how are we to interpret the command to fill the earth and subdue it theologically, but also in light of, of redemption and, and reconciliation in that covenant? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's a big question. Um, I mean, I, I do think we see this trajectory. It obviously runs through Genesis and then gets picked up at various points in the Old Testament where that language is repeated again and again, and of course it, it falters. And then you've got language in the New Testament that speaks in broad strokes of its progress. Uh, Pentecost and the structure of Acts, most famously. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Uh, Jesus's revelation to John, uh, the affirmation of, of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Um, and, and so I do think we need to affirm it. Now the big catch, and, and this becomes a really complex ethical issue at all sorts of levels, is that there is a, an obvious familial and procreative design in the Old Testament that is accented. And in the New Testament, that is certainly not abrogated. Uh, in the New Testament, that is certainly not dismissed as evil or wrong. But I'm a strong believer that we ought to reassert the classic Christian notion that celibacy is better. Obviously, everyone can't go celibate. Uh, things would stop. But uh, I, I think we ought to read 1 Corinthians 5-7 to again um, and uh, sort of catch again the distinctive reform of the 16th century when Luther and others were arguing for the sanctification of the ordinary. That doesn't mean that we should somehow prioritize the ordinary in all cases. And so you just do have this, this reality that uh, there, is, there is a freedom not to pursue physically procreative expansion of the kingdom uh, because there is a new prioritization of the ecclesial family, uh, which I think is not new. That's, that's intrinsic and, and underdeveloped to be sure, but I think Calvin's right that the, 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 the idea of communion with God being in God's family, even in Genesis, is, is something that will be teased out and developed, um, leading to this notion that fundamentally your most profound uh, family are not blood, uh, but those of the church. And so the notion of, of spiritual children and of, of generational uh, passing on is, is crucial. And so just as much as I think we need, sorry, some of us are Presbyterians, we, we need to strongly reassert the notion of uh, raising children as Christians on the one hand. We also do need to note that there's this remarkable uh, word in the New Testament, and this apostolic word that, that follows Christ's own example uh, of this remarkable calling of, I, I wouldn't call them single, but of unmarried Christians who are able to give and expand the kingdom by God's grace in ways that are greater, strategically. Uh, and that gets complex then in how you think about uh, individual calling, gifting, opportunity, and so forth. Um, 
but I, I, I think faithfulness demands wrestling with both of those strands of thought. For, Help forgive, me out. Forgive yeah. me, but my question was in more, in, that, that's helpful. Okay. My question was in more lines of, of, this, of the subdue it part, the dominion aspect. Oh. I mean, that is certainly helpful. So you're okay. Building, but there's two commands there. I, so I was okay. to, so, to the so latter. Earth Build care. Earth, we got that, now subdue it. That's where sure. dominion, the dominion aspect in light of the, the God who, with whom we are, we are ex nihilio. <laughs> We, whom we are outside of. That, that is, if yeah. he, he has dominion, what is our dominion role? I guess is what I was Sure, thinking. yeah. Uh, I don't know that I have anything terribly helpful to say about that. I, I mean, it, it's obviously a command, um, and, and I do think the, the extent of obedience and loyalty given, that God calls for uh, to subdue the totality of the cosmos, which cer certainly includes the totality of yourself, and which gets voiced so poignantly in Deuteronomy 6.5, love the Lord your God with everything you've got, and picked up by Jesus, uh, and of course, take every even thought captive to Christ. Uh, that, that's affirmed precisely how that connects to earth care uh, or, authority. or authority is is difficult. I, I do think we've got to find a way to note that there is a, we are more than animals. Uh, the image of God is a human moniker. It's not owing to an intrinsic reality. It's actually an extrinsic image. Uh, it points away from ourselves, but it's, it's identified only of us. And Jesus became, or the Son became a human in, in the person of Jesus. Um, so, I think we've got to think that through, but, but I don't have a whole lot of concrete help as to all the details. If I could add, so, Michael. Uh, the, please, because well, <laughs> I didn't help much. <laughs> no, uh, part of it, it's the, the cultural mandate then as well. Right. You said you didn't really like that. Um, uh, so, so, right. Or you didn't like the expression of I that. I just don't like the jargon. Okay. Uh, in light of that, especially uh, in uh, our present day culture, the shifting culture, mm -hmm. and where I think some evangelicals especially have gone to the transformation of the culture, and right. what does that mean, and sometimes they maybe bought too much of it, and, and now you've got a Benedictine option, and, right. and all of these other kinds of things. So how, how do you see that factoring in, that original creation, right. fall, and then redemption? Right. Uh, so uh, how do you view those things Sure. Uh, uh, as far as that mandate? Yeah. Well, I mean, I do think there's this missionary calling that is more than mere, merely ethereal or merely personal, but it also has public and even political bearing. I don't simply mean governmental by politics. It has cultural bearing in all its entanglements. Um, you know, we could add to Kuiper's, there's not one square inch. We could add to that, there's not one nook and cranny of my own life. That, that Christ doesn't claim and want to transform. That said, uh, I, I do think there's a whole number of dangers in how Kuyperianism has developed, not in Kuiper, but in you know, Calvinist thought after. Um, you'll be hard pressed to find language of cultural transformation, I think, in the Bible. Um, you will be much more likely to find language of witness and of testimony, and of blessing, and of giving, and of dying. Uh, and, and we do well to, I don't think we do well to have a martyr complex, but a martyr imagination. Uh, because that's the majority Christian experience in one way or another, even if it's not predominantly ours at this moment. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I think there's that remarkable tension of having a, a desire to witness to Christ in every area and to pour oneself out selflessly for the betterment of others in every area of your life, and the awareness that that often means they won't say, even though I'm not a Christian, I'm still glad they're here. No, often they will want to say terrible things of you or do worse, and we ought not be surprised, um, even though we don't pray for that. We pray for, for blessing and use. Um, so, you know, I, I do think for that reason, uh, we need to find ways of thinking about 
not the Benedictine, but, yeah. but, but rhythms and practices commended by folks like Rod Dreher in certain ways that simply describe the kind of thick formation that's necessary to be ready to witness and to lose a lot and to be a humble winner when God kindly gives us success. And uh, I, I suspect most people are like me, we're not naturally good winners, and when we do find success, we tend to get snide or cocky, and we're not good losers, and we tend to be despondent and despairing. And uh, that's not just me, because I see it in the apostles in the New Testament, um, and, and Christian communities throughout history. And so we, we, we do need thick discipleship and rhythms of community that will sustain people to witness whether that means success or failure in a tangible way. It seems to me as well uh, that often I think we are, we are prone to move in an individualistic direction and mm -hmm. we forget, so it's soteriologically, mm -hmm. but at the expense of the ecclesial, the, the, the mm -hmm. church, the corporate. There's a corporateness to our witness as well, and I think mm -hmm. we've, we've so, my sense anyway, we've so emphasized the individual, right. uh, w which is true, but there's also a corporate, there's a whole new community that's been created here right. that, that is, in fact, countercultural. It's an outpost of heaven. Isn't right. It? right. Yeah, and I think the danger is too. The, the, the key is to affirm that without swinging the pendulum. Yeah, exactly. And we're pretty good at the um, pendulum. So finding that appropriate balance yeah. is, is crucial. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Jeffrey. Thanks very much for your lecture today, Mike. I appreciated the way that you were framing the importance of, how did you say it, not narrowing, mingling, or misprioritizing. Right. Um, those are concerns of the uh, creation project more broadly. Mm -hmm. I wanted to name two of our actual objectives yeah. of the Creation Project which fit within that right. and uh, see if I could just push you a little further. Yeah. So one of the things the Creation Project's wanting to do is uh, catalyze the doctrine of creation. Uh, probably think uh, a problem that we have in our engagement with science right now is just a, a truncated doctrine of creation right. which fits exactly your point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the other hand is providing a clear and public guidance to the evangelical church about what does and does not need to be affirmed as, as, there, as controversy abounds, some right. are perhaps legitimate, some illegitimate. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly in the context of your lecture and the doctrine of, of the covenant, the right. theological idea of covenant, how would you say the idea of covenant on the one hand provides a catalyst for developing a fuller doctrine of creation, right. not narrowing and mingling, and on the other hand, how does it help us to think through um, clear and proper guidance for the church on issues yeah. related to the science theology. Yeah, well, it's great. You know, I mean, one of the ways you can think about it is to inventory the main topics that, uh, this is what scholastic theologians do, but they inventory the, the, the main areas in which you've got to talk in talking about creation. The, the agent, you've got to talk about the act or the event, you've got to talk about the, the character of the object, and then you've got to talk about the purpose. And you could line it up with fourfold Aristotelian causality, of course. Um, and, and I think it's safe to say, unless I'm not getting out enough, that most discussion about creation sits at the second level, right? Uh, the act, and to some extent the third area in terms of the object of creation. Albeit, frankly, in a pretty narrowed view of, of the object, uh, um, sort of simply construed as, as, as you know, at the end of, of the first week or at, you know, at, the, at the end of a history of, of development in primeval past, uh, what do you have in, in pretty tangible ways? And I think covenant helps give you a broader set of categories that help affirm breadth that includes those kinds of questions, uh, but, but prioritizing them, uh, realizing that you know, most fundamental is something that is intrinsically uh, undiscoverable by means of materialistic access. That is, that, that, that we are image of God, that we are made for life with God, that we are granted a soul and a, a spiritual existence. Um, and, and so there's that emphasis but not at the expense of the breadth that covenant 
gets defined by things like eating fruit from trees, having foreskins cut off, and dumping water on people. Uh, you know, those are just very tangible, social, physical realities. Uh, and, uh, you know, so all sorts of, of political and embodied uh, and sexual and procreative kinds of facets of our being are, are, are bound up there. Um, but it, it frames them in terms of priorities. And at least my neck of the woods, the predominantly sort of conservative reformed world, uh, has been, I think it would be safe to say, overwhelmingly concerned with not falling, not falling prey to the worst of revivalistic piety, and in so doing has oftentimes either eclipsed the spiritual and the pietist or outright mocked it. And ironically, sometimes in the language of covenant, which is very strange. Um, but, but in such a desire to not be the worst stereotype of uh, don't shine the brass on the sinking ship, uh, or of a, a very radical version of dispensational eschatology, not, not even a normal one. Um, there's been a strong emphasis on matter, embodiment, culture, sexuality, and so forth, uh, which is not wrong until it, it becomes malformed in terms of proportion mm -hmm. and emphasis. And exegeting passages, Genesis 17 and others, I think helps frame priorities uh, so that those become good words, not idolatrous words. Um, yeah. Well, we've got time for one more question. Let me end with a practical one if I could. Mm. Uh, and that is, in light of uh, the covenant creation, uh, I, I appreciated greatly, Michael, how you framed it. That is, Charles Taylor's expressive individualism and, and this mm -hmm. expression from Nicholas Lash, set of protocols against idolatry. Right. And then there is the breadth of the Bible, the ascendancy of order of concern, and a mm -hmm. missionary role. Right. I, I think of that, especially in, in, in the doctrine of creation, in light of the ways in which so many aspects of our humanity mm -hmm. are being questioned today. Mm -hmm. So uh, think about your preparation of pastors right. preaching uh, to uh, parents and children. Uh, what, what is a word that you would give, a word of counsel advice in light right. of the lecture you've given constructively, very, very positively, right. about how to respond to these, this confusion about male and female, which is at the heart mm -hmm. of what it means to be in the image of God. Right. What kind of counsel might you give? Sure. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I really do think systematic theology, uh, you know, we train so many church planters, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly ones wanting to go into settings other than the Bible Belt or, say, the Midwest, where you still have much larger Christian populations. Um, but I grew up in Miami. 3% of folks in the metro area go to church, and maybe two-thirds of them know what's going on. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think we need to realize that uh, moral foundations theory is actually helpful here in illumining I couldn't even have a good debate with a classmate or a friend down the street in Miami mm. uh, about the notion of sexual purity because the very concept is absolutely nonsensical. Yeah. Uh, it's not that they think there is some particular ethic that's appropriate and it happens to disagree from mine, but that there is quite functionally no judgment or category related to that. Um, and, and that's just increasingly the case even in churches. So even the notion of reacting is, is to some extent too late. That's why we need to have uh, this, this missionary notion of systematic theology of tying things together, uh, presuming that, that basic words like justice uh, don't actually have sharp edges or any particular meaning to folks. I mean, you see this. You flip on Fox News and MSNBC, and they will use all the same words, and they clearly don't mean the same thing by those words. Right. 
And those are mass media talking heads. That's not like the whole breadth of the country. That's just a partisan divide within the same sort of class of people. And even there are words like opportunity and freedom and justice and law. They have very different definitions. And so, you know, that's why I think for missional purposes, the kind of catechetical and systematic formation that was so at the heart of patristic medieval and early Protestant formation uh, just needs to be recovered. And, and even folks who have cherished it up until recent years, it's, it's being challenged and on the wane at just the wrong time. So uh, things like catechizing children, uh, you know, couldn't be more important. Uh, and developing good resources to catechize converts, uh, sort of like what the, the Roman Catholic Church has done with the RCIA. Uh, we, need, we need similar resources that are, uh, and, and protocols that are a part of the rhythm of discipleship, you know, so that they're not left going to Lifeway Bookstore looking for something that they might find to, you know, bless them. So... Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, my, Let's uh, thank Mike. Mike. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Greg. Well, thank you all for being here, and I would ask you to stand, and we'll, we'll uh, as I think of uh, Michael's lecture, I think of what God has done when we think of covenant. What he's done is immeasurably more than we can ask or think, and so I close with Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly then we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for being with us. Lord bless you.